Welcome to another episode of InRange. I'm coming to you today to talk to you about some more interesting history regarding the AR-15, the AR-10, and military next-generation warfare-style projects, of which the AR-15 was a product thereof. And we're not here to talk about the rifles in particular. We're here to talk about the ammunition. And on this table in front of me, I've got two different boxes of ammunition that in many ways are indistinguishable, but in other ways are quite different. And this is a complex topic that is gray area. In fact, the differentiation between M193, which is the NATO specification for military 556 by 45 with a 55 grain bullet, the original load used in the original AR-15 M16, and commercial 223 Remington is a super fuzzy line. But even more interesting than that, to me, is how involved Eugene Stoner was, not only in the development of the rifle, but the ammunition as well. Now, you're going to find, if you look, some other videos on the internet that are far deeper in terms of getting into the nitty-gritty of exact degrees of angle of neck, um, or etc. technical details between 223 and 556 NATO. And that's not what I'm here to do today. What I want to do with this video is talk to you about how M193 became a designation, how we have on the market M193 and 223 Remington, and how in practice and in use, the differentiation between the two of them, depending on the manufacturer of ammunition you buy, maybe even nothing whatsoever or at all. So in the late 1950s, Eugene Stoner was working on the AR-10, of which you see here a reproduction of one of his earlier AR-10 type designs. And while that was going on, of course, in 7.62 by NATO or 7.62 NATO 308, um, one of the realizations was that 308 in a very lightweight gun is that it has significant recoil. And the Army started a project for the small caliber high velocity ammunition next generation rifle. And they wanted something that was going to be 22 caliber and high velocity. And in this regard, they really started a whole new thing that we see now that manifested in 556, 223, and even Soviet 545. And in the process, Eugene Stoner was tasked with really two tasks to downscale the AR-10, of course, with the help of James Sullivan and others, to a gun that would be small caliber high velocity, 22 caliber, which we see here a prototype version of the AR-15. You can see the lineage is almost identical. They look like the same gun, just slightly smaller. But one of the specifications that the military had for the ammunition, and they've been fixated on this, we see this with M193 and we see it with later M855, and we now see it again with M855A1 in a different way, um, that the ammunition had to be able to penetrate a U.S. steel helmet at 500 yards. It is unclear to me um, what this fascination with steel helmets is at 500 yards, but we see this repeatedly in U.S. military weapon design and ammunition requirements. And so Eugene Stoner, along with Remington Ammunition Company and Sierra Bullets and a few other industry insiders, started working on developing a small caliber, high velocity round that would do just that. And they started with 222 Remington, 222 Remington. And in their process of figuring out what powder and what bullet weight, etc., they came to the conclusion that with a 24-inch barrel, 222 Remington could achieve that task of penetrating a U.S. steel helmet at 500 yards, albeit with a 24-inch barrel out of a bolt-action rifle at pretty significant pressures. And the military looked at that and said, yeah, you got it, but that is a higher pressure than we want to deal with in the cartridge in terms of wear, tear, etc. So they went back to the drawing board and modified the 222 case to make a 223 Remington, which we see here, which really is nothing more than 222 with slightly more volume. And by increasing the volume, they reduced the overall operating pressures and achieved the velocity that Eugene Stoner determined, which was 3,300 feet per second from the muzzle, to penetrate a U.S. steel helmet at 500 yards. That ultimately became called 223 Special, which then when the U.S. military adopted it, they gave it the designation M193. And in this regard, the differentiation between 223 Remington, 223 Special, and M193 
is really velocity. Like, so 223 Remington tends to run about 200 feet per second less than the M193 equivalent. And that's really about it. Now, but in the process, of course, the military comes up with other things that they need for quality control as well as reliability that is sometimes left off the table with 223 Remington civilian chamberings, or excuse me, cartridges. And they came up in 1976, as far as I can tell, the last official document, MIL-C-9963F, which I will provide a link in the description below. You can read it yourself as a PDF of all the things that are required to make 223 special magically turn into M193. And in that, you'll find a couple things that are required. It has to meet the minimum velocity, which is, of course, around 3,300 feet per second from a 20-inch barrel, although it's actually more in the 3,200 range, all to hit that magical destroy a U.S. helmet or penetrate one side of a U.S. steel helmet at 500 yards. You'll see that it requires water sealant or primer sealant around the primer in the case. You'll see that it requires that the primer is crimped into the case so that it doesn't pop out during high pressure firing or to cause a malfunction. You'll see that there's a requirement to have uh, water sealant around the case mouth. And uh, you will see that there is a requirement for visible annealing on the cartridge case itself. Uh, if you look at uh, M193 properly manufactured, you will visibly see the annealing on the brass case. Annealing is when the brass case is heat treated in a way that you'll see an actual color change from one end of the case to the other. And what this does is prevent or reduce the likelihood of a case head separation or cartridge case split. Case head separation is when the cartridge is fired in the chamber and it extracts the head of the cartridge and leaves the rest of the cartridge case, maybe the mouth and the shoulder, in the chamber. That's a case head separation and it's a significant failure that can really put the gun into a irreparable state without some tools most of the time. There's some tricks you can do in the field to fix that, but it is a significant failure. So, what we get to now, though, is we have this issue that in the modern world, we have 223 Remington and we have M193. And we'll see that some commercial manufacturers will actually sometimes have a box that says 223 Remington and will actually hit nearly M193 velocities. And you'll find some manufacturers that label their ammunition M193 and they're not hitting M193 requirements, such as maybe annealing or crimping or water sealant or even the velocities, as I mentioned. So the line between the two is extremely fuzzy and dependent on who you buy ammunition from. In fact, it's so fuzzy that in practice, people like myself and others, Sinister Rifleman on the channel and a lot of my competitors at Brutality Matches, really it's a distinction without a difference for our applications. We're not worried about penetrating a US steel helmet at 500 yards, and we're not worried about the minimum fragmentation velocity for efficient terminal ballistics on a soft target. So 556, as we said in our video that you may have seen earlier on the channel, if you haven't see it, I'll link to it here, um, is highly dependent on the ammunition itself and the barrel length. And the barrel length plus the ammunition determines the velocity of the projectile. And there is a certain projectile number, or excuse me, velocity number, which I believe is around 2600 feet per second, might be 2700. It's not something that I'm too worried about means that at that at that velocity with a projectile perhaps one with a cantilever which by the way is like a little bunch of little striations that are better for crimp is more likely to fragment and yaw in a soft target once you go below that velocity you suddenly don't necessarily cause as much terminal ballistics or really lethal damage to a soft target and with a 20 inch barrel and properly loaded m193 that number is somewhere around 175 to 200 yards. And as you decrease the barrel length and decrease the velocity, you decrease the range in which that fragmentation occurs. However, in terms of actually being able to engage and hit targets, if you're not worried about that fragmentation magical number, um, 223 Remington, even at 200 feet per second less, really does exactly the same thing. And in fact, your zero for the most part, except to more extreme ranges, doesn't even change. So the other thing you need to think about when it comes to M193 versus 223 Remington is the pressure generated by the cartridge. Now, 
ironically, you'll see misinformation on the internet. You'll see that 223 Remington runs at around 55,000 55, PSI, and you'll see some number about M193 at 63,000. And so you will assume that M193 runs at a higher pressure than 223 Remington. But it turns out the reason for that is because the testing differences between SAMI, which is the International Organization for Civilian uh, Cartridge Designations, and the military method of testing of cartridge pressures is different. SAMI tests the pressure via a hole through the chamber near the middle of the cartridge case, and the military was testing it at the case mouth. The case mouth generates more pressure. And so if you actually test both 223 Remington and M193, even properly loaded to full spec, with the proper in a proper chamber with the same testing method, you're going to find that they both run at almost the same identical pressures of 55,000. So you would then assume that 556 should be safe in any gun that can chamber 223, and you'd be mostly right, but sometimes not. And it turns out it's not because of the pressure generated by the cartridge in its normal loading. It's because of the chamber differences between 223 and 556. Even though there are slight differences in neck and other little elements of the cartridge case, both will chamber no problem in either chambering. So you can stick a 223 in a 556 chamber and you can stick a 556 in a 223 chamber all day long. They will seat, it'll go into battery and it will fire. The difference is that some of the M193 projectiles have a longer ogive, which is the shape of the bullet. And in 556, the free bore or the jump between where the bullet leaves the mouth of the cartridge and then engages the rifling is longer than at a 223 chamber. As well as 223 chambers tend to be tighter in general for higher accuracy. So a 556 chamber is essentially a sloppy 223 chamber with a little more jump for the bullet to deal with military cartridges that have a longer ogive on the projectile. So if you stick a 556 cartridge with a longer ogive on the bullet, into a 223 chamber, the amount of free bore between the bullet and the rifling may be even zero, and that does cause a pressure spike. Does it cause a pressure spike sufficient to blow up your gun? Unclear, probably not, but I'm not recommending it. But what that means is that if you buy 223, you can fire it in any gun and not worry about it ever. If you buy M193 556, you should really only fire it in guns that are labeled with a 556 chamber. But you can fire 223 Remington in your 556 chamber all day long, and it won't make any difference whatsoever as long as the cartridge is loaded hot enough to cycle the action of your gun. So, so in summary, the differences between 223 Remington and M193 are the military specifications that make 223 Remington into M193. And those specifications, in aggregate and in simplicity, are an annealed case a primer that's been crimped, water sealant on the primer and the, the, the projectile, and achieving a minimum velocity of approximately 3,250 feet per second from a 20 inch barrel. That's it, that's the big difference. So when you buy civilian Remington 223, you'll see that it's probably not annealed, it's probably not crimped, it's probably not water sealed, and it's probably running at pressure at velocities about 200 or maybe 150 feet per second less than the M193 equivalent. That said, just because a box says M193 on it doesn't mean it actually is M193 by military specifications. And you need to look at it yourself or even test it yourself or look at other videos that have done that for you. I hope this clarifies this. And this, this is why when we were doing the video about barrel length and velocity, we called P P PMC bronze, which is clearly labeled 223 Remington. We called it M193 because for most of us that shoot a lot, the difference is the distinction without a difference. But if you're very worried about terminal ballistics or getting that extra 200 feet per second, then you probably should be buying mil spec, mil serp. This happens to be MEN German M193 that'll achieve all of the military minimum requirements for M193. Hopefully this clarifies things. You can find videos on the internet that are going to go much deeper dive than this than I did. I'm not that interested in getting into you with like a, a couple degrees of separation on a shoulder head or anything like that. That's just, this is more about how did 223 or 222 Remington become 223 Remington and how did 223 Remington become 223 Remington special and then what magic sprinkle dust and requirements from the military turns 223 Remington into M193.
Hopefully you enjoyed this content. If you like it, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We are a Patreon supporter project. Without you, the viewer, supporting this channel, we can't do content like this. This stuff is demonetized on YouTube, and I have been there for years. It's you, the viewer, that keep this channel alive, and I'm thankful for each and every one of you. Patreon.com slash InRangeTV. And if you like this stuff, again, even if you can't support us on Patreon, you know what? Subscribe to the channel and share with your friends. Help us out with the algorithm. Leave a comment below, etc. Thanks for watching.